we have Lynn Sharkey from uh, Abcon. They're, they are uh, abrasive manufacturers in Coot Hill and Cavan, and they are kindly making a presentation today on um, industrial abrasives in the woodworking industry. Um, Lynn will present um, the paper on the abrasives, and then Gary, who is their technical sales manager, will take any questions anybody would like to fire at him. Okay. So, yes. I just one thing is just um, please. I, I, I'd like to, to make sure that you all have your mics, uh, except for, for Lynn, have your mics turned off um, while Lynn is speaking, please. And thank you very much, Lynn. Please go ahead when you're ready. Lovely. Well, Bill, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting us to, to chat about abrasives with you and your group today. So, as I say, my name is Lynn Sharkey, and I am the Sales and Marketing Director for Abcon. And Abcon is a company based in Cootill County Cavan. It was established in 2005 um, and out from a management buyout of the Abrasives Manufacturing Division of ATA. So in actual fact, our owners and a lot of our production team and some of our sales team actually have experience in sandpaper abrasives and their applications, which dates back to about 1994. So we really do have a wealth of experience when it comes to the technology behind abrasives and their applications. So we started off in 2005, there were about 13 people in the company. We now employ about 144. Um, we're recruiting at the moment, which is why I'm a little bit uh, um, unsure it's around that figure. Um, about, we do have two manufacturing divisions. Our other division is um, industry rubber holes. So it's about 72 uh, of those people are, are worked, uh, work in the abrasives division. Um, so we are the only converter of abrasive belts, rolls and discs in Ireland. And we manufacture and test obviously in accordance with the strict quality requirements and we're ISO 9001 certified. So quality and um, customer satisfaction is really key for us. And that is that has meant that we have kept a really loyal customer base um, throughout those years, um, even through downturns and everything that, the, that we've experienced, uh, that all the challenges over the last number of years. Um, we really are, our ethos is service-based manufacturing. So we offer great technical support and that would be at sales. So our reps, our sales agents and reps would go into our customers and they usually, they look, you know, they'll always ask, what are you using the product for? In the hope that we can add value by uh, looking at their process, looking at the systems and see if we can maybe suggest a, a better alternative for which will actually save time in the long run and produce the finish that the customer wants uh, and is trying to achieve. So we can also manufacture, because we're manufacturing in Cushel, we can manufacture any size. So from file belts right through to white belts, up to 11, 1200 mil wide, we can make um, any size at, at all. So we often find that people call us because they have maybe an old machine, which is an unusual size. And um, so we, um, we always like to be able to, to help, help people out and uh, we will certainly uh, make whatever size is needed. So the sectors that we sell into are obviously woodworking joinery, but also uh, we would sell a lot B2B to precision engineering, the automotive sector, aerospace, health and safety and stainless steel polishing. Because we, we obviously, apart from the abrasives, we have a range of tools and consumables, which we uh, are distributors for. So basically pretty much anything that is, to, is related to surface finishing that is used on a factory floor or in a workshop, you know, we supply. So that goes to masking tape, cutting and grinding discs, um, overalls, masks, all, all sorts. Um, so we, we have a, a great range to be a one-stop shop where people can get what, what they need with us. So when we go back to the abrasives, we stock a wide range of materials, including allox, zirconia, silicon carbide, ceramic, trisact, felt, non-woven and clean and strip. And we would stock them in all of the popular grits. So we buy in what we term big jumbo rolls of sandpaper, of, of abrasive material. And um, 
we, so we carry a very big range in Coot Hill because we want to be able to offer a fast lead time to our customers. So for example, with our Irish customers, um, if you're ordering belts, so say 10, 20, 50 belts, we want to be able to deliver to you within five working days. So that's why we, we carry a really wide range of stock and in, in the popular grits. And um, when it comes to woodworking, and um, the best materials for woodworking are alox, silicon carbide, zirconia, ceramic and sterate. So again, we, they, they are among our most popular materials anyway. And so I, I guess they all work well, you know, in their own way, but it's also really important to understand the abrasive material and, and relate that to what you're trying to achieve. So and also the, the obviously the wood that you're going to be working on. So the best material is going to depend on the type of wood the condition that it's in and what you're doing with it. So are you removing an existing coating or maybe finishing the surface? So different types of sandpaper with the different types of mineral or abrasive grain on them have varying degrees of durability and cutting ability. And you can see there, I just have two logos of two of our suppliers. So SIA Abrasives and VSM, uh, they would both, we would buy uh, material from their factories in Germany. And we do actually stock a range of other brands of raw materials as well, but they would definitely be our two top suppliers of, of abrasive raw material. So we thought that we might actually just in, in terms of understanding what is the difference between all of the different types of abrasive materials that are out there and obviously the costs can vary as well. We just thought we'd tell you a little bit about how sandpaper is made. So the first process that I'm just going to chat about is the gravity coating process. And um, this is where, so sandpaper is made up of your backing, which is paper or cloth. Um, and it will have a, an adhesive uh, applied to it. And then you, the other element is your abrasive grain, the mineral that's applied to it. So in the gravity coating process, the material will roll um, underneath a hopper and the hopper will release the grain on top of the adhesive material. Now, the problem with this is that all of the abrasive may not perform at its best because gravity will mean that some of the grain will be allowed to lay flat on the material. So basically the sharpest edge may not be exposed. So the uh, second method is the electro, sorry, electrostatic method. So this is where your, uh, the adhesive coated backing will pass above the, the grain and they're passed through an electrically charged field. So the, this field propels the grain upwards onto the material and the grains are embedded in the adhesive with the sharpest edge of the mineral exposed. And this ensures, you know, at the end, in the end product, this will ensure that you achieve optimum cutting, sorry, uniform cutting and optimum performance of the abrasive. So this operation, obviously, as you can imagine, is more costly um, to perform. So it does mean that uh, this, this would account for why some materials are more expensive than, say, the gravity coated materials. Um, just wanted to tell you a little bit about anti-static treatment as well. So during the grinding process, the abrasive material is positively loaded while the grinding belt and the workpiece and the, the, uh, they're negatively loaded. So this is primarily the case when you're um, for uh, grinding polyester lacquers, varnishes, materials that are uh, bad conductors. Um, and it's the reason why the abrasive material sticks tightly to the grinding machine and to the workpiece. So as a result, it means that it's difficult to remove and it's difficult to extract or vacuum the dust. Um, so the, this technology prevents the grinding dust from being electrically charged and making it a lot easier to vacuum and uh, extract the, the grinding dust, the resulting grinding dust. The advantages of anti-static are that it offers you a longer lifespan of the belt because it doesn't become quickly saturated. Um, it, it offers increased cutting capacity of the grit and a better level of finish. Um, so lower maintenance and energy costs and a healthier and more pleasant working environment, which of course we all want to achieve uh, for our operatives. Um, one material now that would have the um, electrostatic coating and the anti-static technology is uh, CIA 1919. So this would be, it's part of the CIA wood range and this would be very popular. It's what we would make most of our white belts uh, from. 
So um, we've mentioned uh, the different materials that, that can be, that are most popularly used in wood. So we thought we might just go through some of the features of the different materials uh, for you. So aluminium oxide, this is the most common all purpose woodworking abrasive. It's the only abrasive material that fragments under heat and pressure generated uh, when you're sanding wood. Um, so as you sand, the aluminium oxide renews its cutting edges constantly. So it stays sharp and cuts for longer. It's a relatively tough abrasive and it's the longest lasting and most economical abrasive material. Next one we're going to have a look at is silicon carbide. So the grain in silicon carbide macro fractures. So it breaks into smaller pieces as you're sanding with it. So this basically resharpens it before the material goes dull. So it stays sharp right up until you've used up the piece of sandpaper, but this happens more, you, you use it up faster than you would aluminium oxide. It's harder and sharper than most aluxes, makes it the best choice for cutting hard materials like wood finishes, paint, plastic, and metal. So this is also a friable material, but it's very hard. So sanding soft wood won't make it fragment or renew its cutting edges. So it will just load and then burn the surface. It's more expensive than alux, but it's a good choice for fine finished sanding by hand, as well as for rubbing out finishes. So sterate is a, a self-lubricating sandpaper. Um, basically a dry metallic soap uh, lies between the grains. So which means that fine chips don't stick to the sterate as they would to a resin binder, which holds the granules. So debris falls away from the paper as you sand. It reduces clogging when denibbing or in some cases when sanding resinous woods or painted surfaces. So this would usually be applied to aluminium oxide or silicon carbide papers um, and it's a dry lubricant so it causes no finishing problems. Zirconia alumina. So uh, zirconia is an alloy, so it's a mixture of zircon and aluminium oxide. It has a long life and a fast cut rate even under heavy grinding stress. As the grain breaks down under heat and pressure, it fractures into smaller jagged pieces. So it's good at dissipating heat, letting the grain stay sharp for longer than most, um, most other man-made and naturally mined grains. So its durability makes it particularly effective on difficult to grind and exotic metals. And it doesn't fragment as much on wood as it does on metals, making it a fast solution with a long life. Great for sanding wood, particularly in the coarser bricks. Ceramic, um, so ceramic grain mi micro fractures and breaks down into smaller razor-like pieces many times before it, before it dulls. It's more expensive than other materials, but it's very tough and highly aggressive. So it delivers two to four times the performance of silicon carbide, but because it's so aggressive, it would be used on hardwood as opposed to softwood. So you have a selection of materials to choose from. So how do you choose the right material for, for your job? And the cheapest material may not be the most cost effective and in most cases it, it isn't. So for example, I suppose that you're, you need to take into account how often you have to change your consumable on your tool. And obviously time is one of our most expensive um, costs when it comes to costing a job. Um, so your price per belt might be higher, for example, but overall cost of job, as in your hours, plus the consumables, the number of belts or discs you might use might be lower. It's always a good idea to talk to your supplier and tell them what you're using your materials for and make sure that you get their advice as well on what's the most up-to-date, best practice, best material and best process to use. So when you, again, so there's one... Obviously, you have to choose your material first, but then, of course, there's a range of grits to choose from as well. So wood has many natural fibres, and obviously when you're sanding, you want to cut and smooth them uh, before you finish the piece. So with dry sanding, you can smooth the edges, remove excess wood, and reduce the overall size of whatever you're working on. Um, mostly in sanding, grits 100 to 180 are used, but obviously there are cases when you might use something a little bit coarser or, or finer. So obviously you would have a different approach whether you're sanding on softwoods or hardwoods. For example, when you're painting use, uh, using an open grit belt, you might start with grit 100 and then move on to grit 120. And with hardwoods, you might start with 120 and then on to grit 150. Lacquering, you would start with 120, move on to 150 and then on to 180. 
So, um, and obviously then if you're using uh, closed grain wood, if you're staining closed grain wood with water-based products, uh, you might use 120, 150 and 180 again there. Um, so coarse grits, so up to Brit 100 would damage a fine wood finish and medium grits, um, Brit 120 and 150 would be considered medium. They're useful for removing old finish or scratches. So stripping wood for a high stock removal or rough shaping, you can use an open coated brace of Brit 40 or Brit 60. They're obviously very coarse. If you're sanding wood to remove heavy, heavy sanding marks and finer imperfections, you might go to Brit 80 to 120. Finishing wood for fine sanding and uh, flattening primer, you might use 150 to 180. And for super finishing or very fine sanding and sanding between coats of paint, you might go as fine as 240 or 320 and up, uh, as fine as 400 to 500 for sanding and leveling between uh, clear coats. So when you're finishing, you always finish sanding in the direction of the grain. The scratches may only become obvious when the paint stain or varnish has been applied. Um, and you might sand several times if the timber is rough, working through the grit grades to a smooth finish. Um, when you're preparing a surface to paint wood, if the paint is water-based, which many are, you'll need to remove waxes or oils by scrubbing the surface with white spirit or sanding it. Always good to use a primer because it'll help to give better protection as well as providing a good base coat, coat for the paint to bond with. When you're finishing wood surfaces, there are many approaches to finishing wood, uh, depending on the purpose, obviously, of what you're going to be using it for. Um, so the uh, choices include waxes, oils, polishes, sealers and varnishes. Um, again, it's always a good idea to keep up to date with the latest in um, available products uh, from your finishing materials supplier, you know. So because obviously everything these days is um, there's new technologies, new options available all the time. So always keep that conversation going with, you, with your supplier when you're trying to achieve uh, the best finish you can. So I'm going to open the floor for um, if, if you would like to join in a discussion about any of those points. And our technical sales manager, Gary O'Connell, is, uh, is here as well. And um, we'd be happy to take any points that you have or any comments you like to make or questions that you have and uh, to chat those through with you. And thank you for listening so far. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you very much, Lynn. That was excellent. I really appreciate your input. Um, would anybody like to ask any questions? Nobody coming in there yet. Okay, Gary, there's one question I'd like to ask initially. Is, yeah. In my experience, I come across people who favour paper belts and people who favour cloth belts. What are the best, what are the indicators to decide whether you should use a paper belt or a cloth belt? Well, usually paper belts are used on, on wide bed applications on your drum sanders. Uh, the cloth belt, it is a better product, but it's also a lot more costlier product. Uh, the cloth belt in joinery business is usually on long belt, you know, where you're using your seven meter long belts um, because it is, it's able to take the stretch because um, you're using a pad, you may be forcing down I have come across uh, cloth belts in joinery, mainly used on very hard woods where maybe uh, knots or maybe reclaiming wood, you know, wood that may have imperfections in it, maybe bits of nails in it, something like that. But generally it's paper belts and like a big part of the paper belts is the backing, you know, like for a 40 grit belt, you need a very, um, solid backing in the paper belt. Light, like, of course, the heavier the back and the costlier the belt is, but it does make a huge difference to the lifetime of the belt and also that you're not uh, tearing or stripping. There is one drawback to paper belts is the storage of them, which often is always a problem in joinery. Usually the belts come in, um, um, a box sleeve and they should be kept in that at all times until they're used. Sometimes people take them out and if it's a humid or a damp environment, 
you will get the edges of the belt curling in. The next thing they're put on the machine and they catch on something on the rib. So keeping the belts dry is a huge advantage um, to getting the best performance out of them. So, um, I, I noticed in quite a few factories that they have belts hanging up um, near the yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's perfectly fine. If they're hanging up, I would like to, usually they're hanging up on a pole coming out of the wall. Yeah. It'd be best actually to put a piece of wood to keep weight on the belt, if you know what I mean, on the drop of the belt. Put through something to just to keep the edges from curling in, to keep a bit of a weight on the belts. Yeah. Okay. Usually hung up, so it's it's ease of use to get them when you want to change a belt or whatever. But it is important to keep them dry, especially the paper belts. Uh, the polyester belts, um, they don't react so much to um, the humid conditions or damp conditions, but it can have an effect on them as well. So, yeah. uh, that's it. But uh, usually the cloth belts, we'd find your bigger sales with them is on the long bed sanders, you know, where you're using maybe seven meter, nine meter uh, long belts. Uh, yeah. That's where the cloth comes to more of advantage because of the strain over such a length, the cloth is able to take the pressure. Yeah, and often on that type of machine also, but there might be a curve in the workpiece that they want. That's to right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, another reason cloth belts would be used maybe in shaping wood, like we'd sell a lot of cloth belts uh, to maybe people making horleys, um, something like that. Yeah. And we talked earlier about zirconia. Now zirconia would not be used in the joinery industry too much, but it is extensively used in where maybe shaping wood, and that would be the horry makers, where they take a, a lump of wood and they would grind quite heavily the shape of the Horley out of it. And they'd be in the low grits in your 36, 40 grit, um, and they might finish on an 80 grit. It's a very, very aggressive grain, the zirconia, but it's really more for shaping wood. So it is. Oh, yeah. uh, it's the ceramic now is also becoming a major um, mover in that area, like um, especially maybe in the, floor sanding industry, you would find ceramics starting to grow now, but also zirconia would be the um, abrasive that we'd actually recommend for floor sanding, you know, so especially on old oaks. And How much more expensive is the ceramic belt? Probably? The ceramic belt is probably about four times more costly than the paper belt. Really? Yeah. Four or five times, but it's vastly used in the um, stainless steel industry right. uh, yeah. because it has a very long lifetime, a very high stock removal. Um, like we, if you ever go in on our YouTube website, you will see a demonstration of ceramic and how aggressive it is. You could actually walk an iron bar into a um, um, a linisher machine and you could just see it eating yeah. away like a one inch iron bar within seconds. It's very, very aggressive. Um, it's actually very open grain, so it's very, very good for floor sanding now. So it is, it won't clog too easy. And a belt, whereas a zirconia belt, uh, you might use uh, one ceramic for maybe three zirconia belts, one ceramic for maybe eight to 10 silicon carbide belts. You know, that is the advantage of it. It's very, very long life. A very dramatic yeah. demonstration of you, you pay what you get for and you get the work out of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's it. That's it. But um, as I say, the ceramic, you would not very much at the moment. Um, another thing is just uh, often people just ask me why are there arrows on the back of the belt with the direction of the belt to be used and I'll just go back to the what Lynn described earlier about the electrostatic treatment because that is the movement of the belt in the production area so your grains are going to slightly lean to one side so by putting the belt on and running in the direction of the arm, arrows you will get the optimum performance. If you turn it around the other way, you will get a slight bit of drag, but you'll also clog the belt because you're actually, there's an area that on the brace of grain that will actually hold the dust. So yeah. that is one of the reasons why you'll always have the arrow on the back of the belts and why you should always load your machine 
with yeah. the indication of the arrows. Yeah. Very interesting. I, I, I was a little surprised to see you mentioning 40 grit and 60 grit because I always feel that um, they're more agricultural instruments rather than woodworking instruments. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> now the 40 grit. Yes. Uh, but I suppose it, there would be some instances where people wouldn't have a planer or something that they'd want to. That's that's exactly it. We do. Down with that, yeah. yeah, it wouldn't be huge sales or sales, but we do sell 40 great white belts into the joinery business. And uh, you find it in the where people are maybe reclaiming wood, uh, that type of industry, you know. Yeah. Um, but but definitely in shaping wood, like Horley Makers, floor sanding, 40 grit and 36 grit is the most popular. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. You mentioned the reclaiming wood. That's something that's going to become more and more popular. Um, and only yeah. yesterday I was walking around my estate here and I came across two uh, waste bins, both full of timber where people are converting their attics. And yes. the two bins were full of what was referred to as waste timber. But of course, it, yeah. it, it would be readily recoverable. It's a shame to see it going to landfill. So, oh, definitely. It's probably something we are seeing a lot more maybe on our B2B shops is maybe people doing up their house and like back maybe 10, 15 years ago where pine doors was all the fashion. Now yeah. everyone is painting their doors, painting the architrave. And by right, you, sh you shouldn't really have to take out the old architrave. You can sand down the doors, put in filler if there's scratches or marks, whatever, repaint them, and it can be just as good as new again. So it can. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, reclamation is becoming a lot more fashionable these days. So it is. Oh, well, that's even going to become more fashionable because with the green yeah. people and the circular economy and sustainability, uh, we're going to have to eliminate waste. And, well, definitely, and, yes. And that's that's going to lead to this new project we're starting along the border region. We'll have a heavy emphasis on sustainability and the circular economy. And we would expect it to um, lead to some quite a lot of innovation in terms of how we approach um, the design of products, you know, um, yes. so that we can have products replaceable. Um, it may also lead to, I, I, I would hope, to renting um, furniture rather than buying it. Uh, I think that that certainly will come uh, in for people who are renting furnished accommodation and that. They'll also rent the furniture and then uh, the furniture will go back um, when, when they feel it's past its, its useful time, you know. Yes. That's a great idea, yeah. Pardon? That's a great idea. Well, I think it'll happen. I, yeah. I, I remember quite a few years ago, I was working down in the Caribbean in St. Vincent, and I came across this genius of a man uh, called O.T. Myers, a very large black man who never wore shoes. He actually, I brought him up to Ireland for a visit, and he came in his bare feet, and he walked all over factories in Ireland with his bare feet. But anyway, he... He had a system whereby he manufactured, he employed, he was the biggest manufacturer on the small island, but he also exported to other islands. But the way he worked is that he undertook, everything was bought on the never and ever. People came in and they decided what they wanted and they could buy it over three years or over five years. And when he had it worked out that after the middle of the second year, he'd made his money. So he had another half, another 50% was going to net profit. And he had a continuous cash flow because he, I mean, he said to me one day, I was standing in the shop with him and there was a queue of people there. He said, look at them, Bill, look at them. They're all coming in there to give me money. And he was so right. They were there collecting, coming in to pay their money. But the interesting thing there was that he used to always take, by the time, they'd reached their five years particularly, the suite was worn out because they, you know, the whole family lived on the suite and the dog and the cat and the chickens as well. And by the end of the, the fifth year, that suite was finished. 
and then he would sell them another suite. And he'd go and he'd collect the old suites, he'd bring them back into the factory, have them stripped down, and he'd use the frame. And he'd make another suite. He might add a little bit to it to change its appearance or whatever, and that would go back into the shop as a new. And that man made a lot of money. Very good. A number of the big retailers around the Caribbean came into the island and tried to compete with him, and he beat them all off. None of them could compete with him because he had his system and he had a continuous cash flow. Very good. And it, it was just so much to be learned from, from, from him. It, it, was, it was fantastic. Brilliant. So anybody, any more questions there? I don't see anything up on chat. Hey, have you any problems with, with, with sanding or abrasives? We have, um, if, if anybody does have any questions that they think of afterwards on our website, there's a belt inquiry form. So um, it just can be a convenient way to send in a, a question or inquiry as well. Yeah, very good. Just, just on, 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 as, as an aside, if you like, uh, Lynn, are you experiencing difficulties with material price increases the same as the wood industry is? Yes, you know, we, we certainly are. And it's a, it's a movable thing as well, you know, um, but we're, we're managing to uh, absorb where we can. Um, it varies across our whole product range, you know, but I know our suppliers are trying to absorb some of the additional costs as well. And um, so we, uh, we did have to, um, yeah, we, we had to apply a price increase th this, this year, you know, uh, we do try some years to, to not, not go there. But yeah. unfortunately, we did have a, a slight price increase. We have a, a tried to absorb as much as possible. We're always trying to be as lean as we can in our production and in our admin systems so yeah. that we can make ourselves more efficient, you know, so in that way, be able to um, try and make sure the customer gets great value for money. And um, but yeah, we did have to apply a, a small price increase for sure. Um, because I think it's, it's a combination of the cost of commodities and also the additional uh, transport costs across the world that people are experiencing, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, unfortunately it seems to be par for the course this year. I think everything's going up really, isn't it? Yeah, well, in, in the timber industry, everything is going up because of course, wood is a commodity and it's, it's um, there's huge pressure on, on wood as a commodity across yes. the United States and across Japan and Vietnam so that that's affecting the whole world supply and also with board materials a lot of the board materials particularly plywood and that was coming out of the far east and um, the chinese import an awful lot of timber from canada turn it into plywood and send it back out and um, that has a huge increases in the cost of transport because so many containers ended up with covid ended up in the wrong places oh yeah it's crazy so we, 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 yeah up. We ha hold a, a large stock of raw materials, you know, and we were this year, we, we actually um, increased our stock because obviously that is an issue with, um, with containers, with transport generally, you know, across, across the, the globe at the moment. So yeah. um, that's why we, we carry such a, a big stock in Abcon, you know, so that we don't sort of, if there's a problem, you know, we, 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 can, we still have material in stock. We, we can afford to wait a couple of weeks if there's a delay, you know. Right, yeah. Gary, can I come back at you with another question? And yeah. this is, what is the biggest problem of, if you like, of misuse that you come across uh, with, with people using abrasive belts in, in, in our industry, in the wood industry? The biggest problem I always find is storage, to be quite truthful. It's, you know, really? story. Yeah, yeah, no. Belts curving up its edges and then they're tearing and. They can't understand why, you know, the first belt worked great and then it's a bad batch of belts. And you actually find it's actually, you find the biggest problem is always storage, especially with paper belts, because they will curl at the edges of so the wheel. Um, machine settings, of course, yeah. Um, maybe not adjusting the sheet machine enough between maybe a 60 grit and a 120 grit. Um, the other problem is trying to maybe shortcut. Uh, I'd always say never jump twice the grit size, you know, so... Like if you use um, 
an 80 grit, you can't just go to a 180 grit. You'll have to put a 120 in between, you know, or never jump twice the grit size because yeah. it will always show up later when you do the coating. You'll see the imperfections then. Um, hey, you would like to come in there with a question? Yeah, I, I just pick up on, Jerry what was said earlier on about uh, hanging belts. Like, we find we have to hang the belts. Uh, otherwise, uh, trying to load them in the machine, uh, we find uh, it's a lot more difficult if it comes straight out of your tubes. And yeah. like, so we hang them, but we hang them in a, we've built a cupboard with a heater in it. Oh, well, that's perfectly fine. Once you take the moisture out of the air, that's the key thing. Uh, and if you other... are hanging them, I'd actually have a little, uh, you know, a small piece of wood sitting in the, the, the bottom loop of the belt just to keep it straight, you know. It allows you to help you with your machine when you're putting it on. Yeah. I can understand where you're coming from because it has the curves of the box in it if you take it directly out of the box. But it is important to keep it dry. And you're right, you, you're you perfectly set up with having a heater in the cupboard. That's that's perfect, you know. The, the other thing that we find that helps a lot as well is um, we run the machine without uh, anything going through it for about 15, 20 minutes before we actually start sanding. Yeah, that's the help to center the belt up. It centers the belt, but also it, it, it warms the belt up a certain amount, so you get a more even yeah. sanding. Yes, yeah. No. <laughs> You you are ahead of the game on you're a, you're perfectly right in what you're doing yeah That's, but uh, as I say it's um, we like but we do get I I'd say the biggest problem I have is the storage of belts and what you're doing Abe is perfectly perfectly adequate it's more than adequate like having the heater in the cupboard um, is. I do work, walk into workshops and, you know, the belts are sitting on the floor beside the door and it's raining outside, you know, so, you know, that's not the environment they should be in. Yeah. Um, do, you, so. do you issue a little brochure or a little uh, mind your belts instruction pamphlet with, with, when you're delivering? Would, would that be counterproductive to say it? Yeah, that's not a bad idea, Bill. Yes, <laughs> um, I, I I do think that that you know very often uh, people get careless, and if if there's a, a notice put up beside a wide belt machine or even an over belt head belt sander, or that, you know, to, to remind them about the care of their belts, it can be it yeah can be helpful. Sometimes it can be ignored, but it, it can be helpful. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> There you go. That's our new, our next newsletter, Bill. Thank you. We we credit you with the idea for that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> something here from Alan O'Donnell to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn, Bill, and Gary. Informative talk. I always find I default to what I was taught 25 years ago. I haven't been paying this side enough attention. It's good to keep fresh and up to date. That's just a comment from one of our attendees there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alan. Very good, Alan. Thank you. No, it's, 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 I, I find, I was in the lacquer business for some years and I found that, and that's why I was asking you about the belts, what are the problems? Because we, you would, we constantly had problems, but when you got down to the core of it, the problem, it was always, it was 99.9% misapplication or misuse or a poor substrate which was causing yeah. the problem and not the actual material and um, you very rarely had a default in the supply of the material it was almost always in an, an application and um, fault and uh, sometimes you can lose business because your materials or your belts or whatever it is you're doing doesn't appear to work correctly yes. Yeah. If you go to the root of it, it so often is uh, a problem of um, application and misuse. And, and yes. for that reason, it's, I, I think it's very helpful and useful to make people aware of the things that they really should do to keep themselves mm. safe and to keep their belts running correctly. I think it's it's why with our, our sales team um, and obviously we have uh, all of our reps are, are technical. Well, Gary supports them all as well. 
Um, but that's why we're so keen to always get onto the factory floor because we know that we can add value by looking at someone's process because people are busy and they just carry on doing what they're doing, reordering the same product, you know? So sometimes it just takes a fresh pair of eyes to come in and have a look and see, well, actually, do you know what? Instead of using three grits there, if you use this belt, you might use two or, you know, whatever the case may be. So it's always really important to, to look at your processes regularly. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's really important that technical reps should be allowed onto the floor yeah. to see how the application is happening. I think factories that don't allow um, technical reps in are actually doing themselves a big disservice because they can save them an awful lot of money over time. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's very I've had many messages uh, from customers where Gary has in particular has saved them a lot of money and time, you know, so, and it, it helps us because then customers are loyal to us because they know they can come back and count on, on good advice, you know, so. Yes, of course. Yeah. I would agree entirely. It's very good. Mm -hmm. anybody, anybody, any further questions or answers or thoughts about what we've been dealing with? takers okay well look lynn and gary i thank you both very very much we have recorded it and we will distribute it i'd say very very many thanks to you i'm sorry we're such a small crowd today but we will distribute your your talk 